Well, good afternoon and good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Brooke Morgan, and I am an archaeologist, curator of anthropology, and NAGPRA practitioner at the Illinois State Museum in Springfield. In 2019, I had the privilege of working with the Australian Institute of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies Return of Cultural Heritage Project to return 42 culturally significant items in the Illinois State Museum's collection to two Indigenous communities in Australia. Since that time, the ISM has committed to continuing the work that leads to repatriation of ancestors and belongings to their descendants. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge that I'm connecting today from the traditional homelands of the Peoria, Kaskaskia, and Kickapoo peoples. Springfield was also a stop on the Potawatomi Trail of Death in 1838, when Potawatomi were forcibly marched to Kansas. I pay respect to and celebrate the resilience of Indigenous peoples past and present. I encourage each of us to take time and research the Indigenous story of the location where you may live and work. Thank you for joining us for today's conversation, Museum Dialogues. Today's conversation is the third in a four-part series looking at the return of the ancestors, belongings, and cultural heritage of Indigenous peoples, which are currently held by museums and other collecting institutions around the globe. The Expert Mechanism on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, or MRIP, provides the United Nations Human Rights Council with expertise and advice on the rights of Indigenous peoples. It assists member states in achieving the goals of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of, of, of Indigenous Peoples, or UNDRIP. A little over a year ago, the University of British Columbia hosted an expert seminar in support of MRIP on the theme repatriation of ceremonial objects and human remains under the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. One of this seminar's objectives was to provide input to an MRIP report on the repatriation of ancestors, belongings, and treasures of Indigenous peoples currently in the hands of state institutions like museums and universities. The report was presented to and adopted by the United Nations Human Rights Council in its 45th session in October 2020. In a spirit of global collaboration, several museums, universities, and one of the International Council of Museum Committees, ICOM, came together to develop this conversation series and continue the dialogue initiated by the University of British Columbia a year ago. I want to thank each one of these partner institutions who have made this event possible. The Illinois State Museum, the Residential School History and Dialogue Center at the University of British Columbia, the Museum of Us, the Ohio History Connection, the Canada Research Chair on Civic Museology at the University of Montreal, the Maryland Institute College of Arts, and ICOM's International Committee on Collecting, ComCall. As professionals working in museums, universities, and the International Council of Museums, all of which are directly addressed in the report, we believe that it is necessary to move our institutions forward, finding tangible ways to fulfill the report's recommendations. Let's meet the speakers who accepted our invitation to take part in our third conversation and have joined me here today. With us today are Dr. Adriana Munoz, Curator for the Americas at the National Museums of World Culture in Sweden, Annabella Carlon Flores, a human rights defender and descendant of Yaqui and Mayo indigenous cultures, Dr. Purity Kiura, who is Director of Antiquities, Sites and Monuments and a Senior Research Scientist with the National Museums of Kenya, and Dr. Steve Nash, Director of Anthropology and Senior Curator of Archaeology at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science in the U.S. I'll ask our panelists to introduce themselves and talk a little bit about their experience in the field of repatriation. Uh, we'll start with Adriana, then Annabella, uh, followed by Purity, and finally Steve. Um, so Adriana, you can begin. Um, good evening from Gothenburg in Sweden, and thank you so much for this invitation. Um, I, as I you told, I am the curator for Americas in the Museum of World Culture in Gothenburg, and uh, I have been working with topics inside museums for almost 30 years now. So I have been doing all the job that you can do from create that the creator can can make. Um, it's it's okay. Mm -hmm. Annabella. 
Good morning from Sonora, Mexico. My name is Anabela Carlon Flores. I come from two original cultures, the Yaqui and the Mayo. I appreciate the opportunity to participate in this global conversation on the return of cultural heritage. Um, I studied law at the University of Sonora. When I decided to do it was because I saw the past and the present of my people. At that time, I never imagined that the enjoyment and respect of our rights as indigenous people would cause us discredit and criminalization. And currently I am a member of women organization and we work to protect the cultural and natural heritage of the Yaqui territory. I am a co-coordinator of a Yaqui and Conca team of participatory video facilitators. I am also an active member of the Masa uh, that is in Yaqui, it means win strength of the traditional authorities whom I support in the activities that they delegate. And my experience in the field of repatriation is not very extensive because not many repatriation processes has been carried out by our people. Uh, I don't know if now I can mention the three moments that we have uh, been living as Jackie people. Uh, first one, was the historical moment because it was the repatriation of human remains in 2009. These remains came from the Museum of Natural History in New York. Twelve skulls, several long bones, textiles, and war material such as bones and arrows were repatriated. My participation in this case, I remembered, was so little. I remember that someone from the government contacted me how to start a dialogue with tribal authorities for the process of repatriation. I gave some telephone numbers away because it was a community issue and needed to be presented for its reflection. According to some, according to some direct participants, it took around a year the process of human remains repatriation. It was a big ceremony organized to the in honor to the Yaqui warriors that came back <clears throat> after 100 years away. <clears throat> the, is, the second moment was in 2011 when I had the opportunity to be in the National Museum of the American Indian in Washington. I also had the opportunity to go to a place where objects are, are I are protected, but they're not displayed. Upon entering, it was a strange feeling. I felt fear and sadness. I felt the sensation of following the footprint of my people. When I started to see the cultural objects, many questions came to my head. How, why, since when did they get there? What were the circumstances? I remember that they showed me a dear head outfit of the Matachin dancer, shells, necklaces, and other things that I didn't know. The person in charge asked me if we want them back home. I said, of course, but not depend on me. So I took the information. <clears throat> I, took the, I took the information to the authorities and to two people that participated in the repatriation of the human remains to be, I'm sorry, but they didn't go any farther because the fight for the water just started in 2010. And finally in 2019, when I had the opportunity to meet the cultural objects in Sweden at the Museum of World, of World Cultures, this time I had more information of the collection. The process has not been easy because the object of Jackie culture found in Sweden as are from the Jackies who witnessed the deportation carried out by the Mexican government under the Porfirio Diaz regime. Although their acquisition was not rude, but the Jackies who gave them to the Danish expedition were not in very favorable condition because they were quite far away from their or land, the land that they defended. When I had the opportunity to meet the cultural object in Sweden at the museum, 
I was thinking how they managed to reproduce and practice the culture. Some material which, which the artifacts or the, the object are made are not the same material that they need to be. According to that, what we, what we saw in the case of scrappers, since the Tlaxcala doesn't have that kind of wood that only grows in the desert, like iron wood. That time I asked myself, when I was invited to participate in Gothenburg, I'm not a member of a Dear Dancer Society or Matachin or Pascolas. But it was to talk about the current situation of Yaqui people. We are living cultures that continue to fight to fulfill our rights. And the spirit of the Yaquis of Tlaxcala gave me an opportunity to speak. It was an honor of knowing and connecting to their legacy. Although in this case, the cultural goods or the cultural objects were not obtained in a illegal or rude way, uh, but we know that there is still part of Swedish, Swedish government. And those are part of our past and present. The repatriation process is a very advanced and is expected by October of this year, the cultural objects, because the Mexican government the state, um, as part of the justice plan for the Yaqui people, is going to ask for apology to our, to our people in October. And I think this is a, this is going to be a way of asking for apology, giving back the object, but I don't know if that will work out, but that is the wall for the Mexican government in this case. I think I can say that. It's much uh, broke. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to each and everyone who is on in this panel and also um, all the attendees. And um, I'm glad to be here. And thank you very much for having invited me to be here. Um, I'm the director of Antiquity Sites and Monuments and also a chief research scientist at the National Museums of Kenya here in Nairobi. I am a trained geologist and also an anthropologist, uh, both from the University of Nairobi here in Kenya and also from Rutgers University in New Jersey, where I undertook my graduate studies in anthropology. And here I am in charge of mainly uh, several museums. We have small museums across the country. So I'm in charge of those small museums and also protected sites and monuments and also objects. So all those fall under the directorate that I direct. And uh, most of the time, what we try to do is uh, to manage and also to conserve the heritage of Kenya in totality. Either whether it's a natural heritage or the cultural heritage, they all fall under my directorate. We also coordinate a lot of training and public programs, uh, including exhibitions in museums, and also just engaging the youth and the public, uh, mainly in terms of uh, what heritage is all about, why they should take care of it, why it's important, why they should pride in it. And also we look at implementation of policies and international obligations, which Kenya is a party to, and all those help us in running the institutions here and making sure that our collections, our objects and our heritage in general is well taken care of. For us to be able to do all this, Obviously, like um, all of you, I, I, I'm sure, uh, we have to also work a lot with stakeholders and also communities. And uh, at the National Museums of Kenya, we actually pride ourselves because we have that um, great niche of being able to work specifically with communities because these are the people 
who can be able to help us in heritage management and also in making sure that uh, we are telling the, the right stories when we display objects or when we have exhibitions. And the history of uh, Kenyan objects uh, being outside um, of Kenya, mainly in the North, I'll talk about those which are in, a, in the North, uh, started way back during the colonial period. And there were several uh, ways in which those collections left um, Kenya. The first one was, of course, um, through trade and explorers who came to Kenya, they collected and they were also trading uh, with other people outside when they were exploring Africa in general. So they were going around and collecting objects and just trading with them. Then there was also around uh, between 1880s and uh, 1963, there was uh, a direct military intervention in which local communities now started losing most of their cultural assets and uh, even human remains. Uh, like for example, we have one case of human remains which was actually taken away during the colonial period. Um, one of the, the, the colonial fighters was killed and his head was actually taken to Britain. And uh, today it's, it, it, I, I think it's in the British Museum. Then um, of course, there were also uh, religious interventions when um, people are being converted to Christianity and other religions. Uh, people came, came into the country and also in Africa, and they were able to convince mainly communities who are uh, holding on tr to traditional objects, uh, mainly for um, sacrifices and for rituals, and uh, they used them for spiritual beliefs. So they were able to convince them to give away those objects, and those objects now ended up being taken in the north. Then, of course, the fourth method was um, there was a legislation in the 1925, which was called the Witchcraft Act, which came into effect in Kenya. And what this really meant is that um, because it was an act, anyone with any object which, which was associated with any practices which um, they, they perceived as traditional or practices that were witchcraft was taken away from them, con confiscated. And then obviously, even today, uh, some of the things which are still going on is um, you come, you get donations, you get gifts, and uh, probably you take away those objects and take them um, to wherever you go. And um, the question of uh, restitution in Africa has not started today. I can say it started way back, just before independence in most of the countries, because that's when the conversation of most of the leaders then started demanding for all these materials which had been taken away from them to be brought back. But then for a little while, it went silent until probably um, just the other day when uh, the president of France came up with the whole discussion again. And uh, now African countries have taken up that discussion and that debate and even started discussing it in their parliaments and also in meetings and communities now are realizing that this is a topic that they need to start um, discussing about. And Kenya um, is not being left alone, um, um, uh, is not being left in the discussions and the, in, the, in the whole restitution movement. Um, we have started putting in place mechanisms of how we can start maybe this debate. There's a lot which is going on in West Africa because of the whole French connection. But when you come maybe to South Africa and East Africa, there's, there's a bit of silence because the, the countries and the governments have still not taken up this topic. One, because we are dealing with other countries, not France. France has come out openly to say, okay, we want to return these, some of these objects. But other countries, like for example, in, uh, in Europe, they have not, in, in Britain, where most of the Kenyan objects are, they have not come out uh, to talk about them. Of course, we have, um, very positive stories about repatriation. And I'm sure uh, Steve will talk about them. I can point out that in 20, 2011, we had received about 39 Vigangos from California State University in Fullerton. Then of course, in 2019, we received the 30 Vigangos from Denver Museum of Natural History. And now we are in conversation with Illinois State Museum to have more Vigangos coming 
and I'll, and I'll later on uh, discuss and show you what pigangos are. And um, one of the things maybe I want to point out as an experience with the whole repatriation uh, issue is that the fact that there's a lot of debate and a lot of discourse with the North, um, even in Africa ourselves, among the African countries, there should also be that dialogue because some of the African countries also hold collections which are uh, from Africa. Uh, for example, I can give you an example of uh, archaeological and paleontological collections, which were collected maybe in the 1960s, 1970s, especially in Tanzania. Tanzania is our neighbor. Um, and those collections were brought to Kenya. They were in thousands and thousands of archaeological and paleontological collections. The reason why they were brought to Kenya is because Tanzania did not have the facilities and, and, the, uh, and they did not have a museum or storage to keep these collections. So all those collections were brought to Kenya. But in 2008, uh, the Tanzanian government approached the Kenyan government for them to be returned and we returned all those objects to them without any um, demands or without telling them what to do. And uh, we were happy to do that because um, we were just keeping them for them. It's not that we, we had them uh, illegally. So uh, there's that discussion which also needs to happen among uh, countries, even within each of the regions, because it's not only from Africa, it's not only the North. We also have collections within, within ourselves. And um, maybe the other thing I can say we are doing as a country, we've already started uh, in inventory of uh, collections that we think are outside. And uh, there's a project which is known as uh, Invisible Inventories Program. It's a, a, a project uh, composed of um, uh, different artists and collectives and museums from Kenya, France, and Germany. And uh, what this uh, program is actually doing is to look at the database of all objects that could be anywhere in the North, um, which were taken from Kenya. Right now, we've been able to identify about 332,000 collections um, from about, um, I think it's from about 30 institutions worldwide. And uh, we know what those collections are, and we know where, we are, where they are. And we have an exhibition right now in our main museum in Nairobi, uh, which is showing all those, the, it's showing some photos and in some cases it's just empty, empty places because we don't know what those objects are or we don't have even information about those objects. So moving forward, what do we want to do as a country? Moving forward, what we want to do is first and foremost, Kenya has not ratified the 1970 UNESCO convention and it's a very important convention for us to ratify. So we are in the tail end of actually ratifying that convention, everything is in place. And uh, by that we'll be able now to negotiate and uh, maybe even work with uh, the institutions that have our collections. Uh, the government has also appointed uh, what we are calling a national steering committee on restitution. And this is a committee that is going to uh, develop a strategy and a policy on how Kenya is going to move forward um, henceforth. And then of course, uh, we still want to continue uh, with the inventory and making sure that we get, we gather all the information, both locally and also internationally uh, on all those objects which are outside. And also we continue with these kind of discussions and debate. And I am very happy to be here because this is just a continuation of what we are doing and what we should be doing, the discourse and the discussions. Thank you very much. I guess it's my turn now. Folks, thank you all uh, for joining us this morning here in Denver, this evening, uh, wherever you may be, uh, this afternoon, wherever you may be. Uh, I'm Steve Nash. I'm Director of Anthropology at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. I've been working in natural history museums uh, for the last 25 years. I spent nine years at the Field Museum in Chicago, undeniably one of the world's great natural history museums with encyclopedic collections. I moved here to the Denver Museum of Nature and Science in 2006, so I've been working uh, on collections here since then. My relationship to the repatriation issue is both personal and professional. Uh, and I say that because I grew up 
at the Field Museum. My father worked at the Field Museum in the 1960s. He was an editor, but he was good friends with the anthropologists and the archeologists. And so I had behind the scenes access to, those, uh, to that great museum from a very early age. My mother worked at the University of Chicago. She was not a faculty member, she was a staff member, um, but I was around um, the, the academics, the scholarship, the museum work um, that was so thrilling in the 1960s and 70s and 80s, but was also not terribly self-critical during that period. Um, and one of the things that I like to think about and point out to people in a moment when we're discussing decolonization of museums, decolonization of institutions, um, and international repatriations and restitutions, is that in those days, the 60s, 70s, 80s, even into the 90s, it's a pre-digital world. And many of these institutions thought it was their mission, and I can agree with it, to bring the world to their hometown. This is the way that people learned about other cultures. That, in, you know, in museums and also National Geographic magazine and other entities like that, but TV wasn't well developed. There was certainly no internet. There was, you know, this is a way that people learned about other cultures and science and so on. And on one hand, that's justifiable and understandable. What's happened in the last 30 years, and again, this is for me personally and professionally, is the, the change that has been affected since the passage of the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act in the United States in 1990, but is a reflection that those, however noble those aims may have seemed at one time to collect and preserve, is that that can't be the end of what museums do. That's, that's one aspect of it, but it is not what museums should be doing, particularly in age when where there's global travel, when there's uh, digital repatriation, and when we recognize most importantly that that collecting activity and the encyclopedic museums did harm, meaningful, serious harm to the source communities. Um, it was colonization, it was colonialisms, it was all of that. Um, and for me, what I realized is that as much as I enjoyed the benefits of an encyclopedic museum, that end up coming at a cost to other people. And then when you look at who is represented in natural history museums in North America, in Europe, in the colonizing nations, what you find is that it is based on discrimination, plain and simple, right? And so for me, I've been working as a scientist and as a humanist and as a person to try and get us to a position in which museums are doing no harm, quite frankly, um, and are not in the business of curating human remains, human souls in the absence of informed consent. So we've been in the United States, we've been um, staying ahead of the requirements of NAGPRA, which only affects Native American remains, We've been, we've been working to, we have repatriated and reburied the non-native human remains that are in our collections. And we're working on sacred objects and other kinds of objects. And as I'll share in a little bit, uh, some of the details on the Vigongo repatriation that Purity and I worked on a couple of years ago. But the key here in that story is that, that we started trying to do that repatriation 12 years ago, 13, 14 years ago now. And it wasn't until Purity and I established a personal relationship at a leadership conference in LA that we were able to actually see that through to its conclusion. So it's all well and good to have noble intentions. It's also good to have laws and conventions in place, but oftentimes this kind of activity comes back to very personal relationships um, that have to be maintained. And this is the big challenge for us all going forward is that if we move on from our positions, who then maintains these relationships? So I look forward to hearing from you and chatting with you further, but that's all I'm gonna say for right now. Back to you, Brooke. Great, thank you all panelists for um, telling us about yourselves and your work. Um, I wanna turn now to um, sort of a case study. So Adriana, um, can you share with us the work that you have done with Yaki materials that are held in Sweden and how did these objects become part of that museum's collection? Yeah, I, I'm, I want to try to, to tell this history short. I have been involved in this case since 2014. And it's a really complicated case because involved in a way three countries. The question of the first question of restitution came from Arizona, but Sweden considered that if it's not coming from the from the embassy, from an embassy, from a state, it's not a formal question. So the, the questions that Arizona sent to the Museum of, of Ethnography in Stockholm in 2004, they were considered informal. Uh, questions of restitution. However, the, I, I, when I became involved in, in this process, so the, the first thing I thought it's we need to involve 
the, the Rio Yaqui, because the objects are coming from, from Mexico. Uh, I, I understand that uh, the, the, after the Yaqui Wars that Annabella told before, when the people from Yaqui became deported. And I think that during the process of, of restitution, we need to put the real words. It's not exile, it's not moving, it's not migration, it's deportation. And they were sent as soldiers to the south, to a place called Tlaxcala. There they met Danish sisters, a couple of Danish sisters, Helga and Budil. And they became, we can see through the archive that they became very close friends. These two sisters were helping them because sometimes we, as Latin Americans, <laughs> we cannot forget that sometimes the worst enemy is the own, the, the own state. The internal colonialism and sometimes has been stronger than the external colonialism in many, many cases in Latin America, at least in Mexico, especially during the Yaqui Wars, when the, the Yaqui people lose part of the land and they still have this fight. This is not history, this is actual. When I became involved, so my, my job has been to involve, and I am not taking decisions. I, I can make, I, I can talk with the, the directors and the politicians and, and give them that guidelines to, to take decisions. But however, my job is to, 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 to explore this collection and, and, the, and, the, and the implications for the Yaquis today, because everything when we talk about collections in, in museums, I am talking, I know that the United States, you have been doing a lot of job because you, you have also people claiming close to you, you are neighbors. Here in Europe, you have the, the, the people that own these objects, the, the, the original owners, they, they are in other countries, in other continents, they are not close to us. So the grassroots people, it's, you need to, to find them uh, and you need to, to establish contacts. So we start a big communication with the people in the Rio Yaqui, um, and especially with a, a, a really good friend that she was br brutal killed uh, in a feminicide case, Raquel Padilla Ramos. And Raquel Padilla Ramos, she in, in involved all the, the people that has been in Sweden, among others, Annabella. For me, the interesting thing that was in the, in the claims from Arizona, it has always been related to one object. It's a masokova called, it's a deer mask dance. Uh, however, for the people in the Rio Yaqui, all the collection, it's really important. I remember Fernando Jimenez, one of the visitors, he said, you cannot, you cannot claim only the head. We, we need all the body. It's, otherwise, it's, it's not complete. And we have been working a lot of about because Sweden, in principle, they repatriate if something has been stolen, and this collection has not been stolen. It was a gift, and, and we can see that the relationship was really good. We, we cannot feel, of course, as Annabella told before, it's these two Danish sisters were white in a country where whiteness is considered better, and the Jackie people were considered prisoners of war. So the relationship was of obvious unequal. Uh, but the interesting thing has been to, to, to see and to incorporate and, and to include all these voices in the archive here and, and to remember daily that restitution is not only about cultural rights, it's about human rights, it's about the rights for the land, it's the right for the history, for water. So it has been a long, long, interesting process. From Sweden, can I say that the most complicated thing is to have this kind of two voices or two dialogues going in parallel, one from Arizona and one from Sonora. And I hope at the end, when these objects go back to, to the Rio Yaqui, everyone feels comfortable with this. The idea to restitute at the end has, is going to be that these objects are so important today, not only as an educational, uh, but they can be used to heal, to heal the, the colonial trauma of being deported from the, the Rio Yaqui to, to Tlaxcala. We are talking about almost 2,500 kilometers. It's a long way. Um, and today, as, as I said before, it's, it's, not the, it's not that the Yaquis today has everything solved. Uh, Annabella told before, it's still a lot of uh, fights and, and, and claims for, for, for water, for land. Things that we usually give forgiven are, are not given, are, are not of 
obviously a given situation there. So we hope that that if everything is going okay, that the people uh, in the Rio Yaki uh, can feel that the ancestors came back. Or, mm -hmm. Thank you. It's going to be a lot, it's been a long, long work. So if people have questions, I can mail me if they want. I, I am open to, to share my information. Thank you. Um, staying on the topic of, of Yaqui cultural heritage, um, Annabella, from a human rights perspective, why is it so critical for the Masakoba or the ceremonial deer head um, to return to the Yaqui? Um, first of all, that human right, I have to say that human rights are universal, indivisible, and interdependent as part of the human rights system. And the cultural rights are established in human rights instrument and a specific instrument on cultural heritage like UNESCO convention and other like the like UN RIP and I love convention 169. But Jackie is trying to fulfill their right to land, water and justice has been massacred, deported and currently criminalizes treated, imprisoned, kidnapped. Proof of this are the cultural assets found in Sweden today, because the Jackies who handed over these assets are witnesses to the deportation suffered during the dictatorship of Porfirio Diaz, because they fought for the defense of the land and self-determination, because they want to have their own government in their own way. They were sent to Tlaxcala, where the objects of the Jackie culture came from. That, that objects represent the position of our past, present, and possibly also of our future. Because the Jueme people not only value the cultural assets, they want to transmit it to the future generation. We can see that they were capable of keeping alive in difficult conditions in all side of our ancestral land because all these cultural objects as part of our community life and collective memory. The return of these sacred objects such as the deer head and the Pascola, Matachin and Fariseo outfit is part of a historical debt with our people. Maybe uh, all these objects um, is an, therefore is an obligation of the state to guarantee the enjoyment of our rights, such as access to the cultural heritage. Cultural rights are collective and individual rights that Jackie should enjoy, at least Jackie's from now, of, Jackie's of now. The, tour, the return of cultural assets, such as the deer head and the pascola, uh, will, will be, will be receiving and linking um, as Jackies from now with Jackies from the tourists. I don't know, it's like a um, connection to this object, to our past. Of course, it's not a very um, um, lovely or uh, good past, but we can value more our culture. And of course, if, we hum if the human rights are universal and disabled and interdependent, I think we need to enjoy them today. Thank you. Thank you, Adriana and Annabella, for touching on the complexity of, um, of, of this. And we look forward to hopefully seeing resolution. Um, and uh, I know we'll be watching the, the, the story closely. Um, so I want to turn now to um, our other case study, 
Um, so Purity, you worked with Steve to receive uh, Vagongo from the Denver Museum. They'll be returned to their communities of origin. Um, can you tell us a little about the Vagongo, um, what they are and their importance to Mijikenda communities? So this is what we call as a Kigango. One is known as Kigango and many are Vigangos. And basically what these are is that they are carved wooden memorial statues which are erected by peoples of the southeastern Kenyan coast. So the people live towards the coast of Kenya and uh, they erect these memorial statues um, for people when they die. And I'll explain um, a little bit what this is all about. Uh, there are about nine tribes within the coast of Kenya who do this and collectively they are known as uh, Mijikenda. So it's, it's, it's a group of about nine different uh, tribes who do, do this and they all do it differently. And these Vigangos are sometimes style, styles and abstracted human forms and they are placed vertically. Vertically, they are placed vertically rising out of the earth in honor of a dead member of a secret society known as Gohu. So there's this group of, um, of elders and you have to go through, through some rituals and some uh, ceremonies for you to be uh, considered as one of them. And it's actually, it's like a sect, it's a societal sect or of traditional leadership or council of elders. And what happens is that uh, people who are initiated into this society are given special recognition after death, mainly by now erecting these kind of uh, markers on their, on their graves. And you find sometimes it's not even done on the graves, it can be done at a homestead, depending on what the agreement with the elders is. And most of these vigangos are made from a very hard wood, which is currently very rare. Like if you are to go to the coast of Kenya, uh, this is a protected kind of hardwood. So at the moment, it's very difficult for someone even to be able to make most of these uh, vigangos. And what happens is that um, each kigango or each of these abstract uh, wooden statues, they serve as medium through which living members of this secret society can communicate now to someone who has died or to their ancestors. And this is probably when, when there's a need, for example, if uh, there's sickness, there's drought, uh, whatever it could be, they just communicate to them because they believe these are spirit, living spirits of the person who has died. So they are able now to communicate to them. And um, some of them range in height. I think uh, Brooke, you are saying some of them are very tall. Some of, actually, of them actually range in height from four meters, four feet, others are even nine feet or even uh, larger than that. And the Mijikenda believe that Vigangos are living objects that actively embody the spirits of departed and honored elders. As such, one should not be, at, be tempted to compare a Kigango with a headstone. You know, uh, we put headstones on uh, graves in the Western tradition. Uh, because um, the Vigangos are mainly considered as spiritual. They are not just headstones of remembrance. Um, and in the early 80s, what happened actually in the early 80s, art dealers in the United States started seeing uh, these, these uh, objects or these collections or these spirits, if I may call them, as objects of um, trade. And uh, they started collecting them. Uh, a lot from Africa. And uh, given the dire economic uh, circumstances of much of Eastern Kenya, and also they were also collected in Tanzania, unemployed young men also started stealing these, 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 these vigangos from communities and actually selling them uh, to middlemen who could then sell them um, to art collectors who are taking them. And mainly of, most of them were actually taken to the, to the United States. If you look at the asking price then, if you are a middleman, maybe a couple of hundred dollars, but by the time they got maybe to the US, 
they could even command ten thousand dollars for each each of the vigangos. And in 1990s, stolen vigangos began to be no, donated to unsuspecting museums across the United States. And you already heard from Steve what was happening because of tax deductions. Maybe people start now giving them away to museums so that they can get tax deductions. Um, in a self-reinforcing feedback loop, museums also benefited from the additions of acquiring objects and collections which were donated to them. And it's only now that most of the museums are realizing maybe this is not the way they should have um, uh, dealt with them. And they are starting to return them. And um, I can say maybe today, there are more than 400 uh, vigangos which are held somewhere in the United States or even more, because we haven't done a, an inventory to know how many of these vigangos are there. Um, you can see uh, some of them have very nice abstracts and this is, you can actually now be able to tell where each of these Kigango came from, from some of these abstracts, because people who are living today know which communities or which families could have made um, any of these abstracts. Uh, this is the, the, the kind of tree which is used to make these Bigangos. Uh, this is a ceremony when elders um, maybe are just sitting together and uh, going through now the initiations or even erecting a kigango for someone who has uh, uh, departed. Um, this picture shows actually the, the interest and the intrigues when uh, the vigangos from, the, from Denver came back to the National Museums of Kenya. This is at the National Museums of Kenya and you can see there's a lot of intrigues and a lot of questions from people because even as we do not understand as uh, it's only the communities and the elders who actually know and value, they, they know the value, the cultural value of these big angles. And some of these young men kept on asking me, why would you uh, uh, take so much time, take so, 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 so much um, finances to be able to bring all these big angles, which to, to them, they didn't have any meaning to them. But now when you go to the communities, to the right owners, they know what they mean and the, the, they value them, they pride in them, and they want them back. They do not want any conversation uh, that, that says that those vigangos can continue uh, staying in, the, in, in places other than where they should be. Uh, you can see here, this is Steve uh, handing over one of the vigangos to the elders. And you can see the smile in these people to appreciate and to see, okay, they have come back, although um, I can also say that when they come back, they do not have as much maybe um, spiritual and cultural value as before they left. Because once you remove a Kigango from its original, uh, or, or, original place, it loses that meaning and that spiritual. And you have to go through a lot of sacrifice and a lot of rituals for you to be able to consider it as being what it meant before. But all the same, they say they should come back because they, they know they still have value in terms of their culture. And they believe that once they come back, uh, life will start go be back to normal. And uh, that's all I can say, uh, Brooke, and I'm sure Steve will talk a little bit more about it. Yeah, thank you for that, uh, uh, Purity. It was a remarkable experience to, um, to go to Kenya. And I wanna share with you some, uh, our, our slideshows are, are in some ways the same. Um, because it was an activity that we both took part in. And um, I want to, it's kind of hard for me to, to, to even know where to discuss this. Here's some of, an image of some of the um, Vigango uh, that were in the Denver Museum of Science, Nature and Science collection that came into us in the 1980s. Um, and we were one of those unsuspecting museums that, that uh, Purity mentioned. The donation offer was made by a Hollywood dignitary, and we said, absolutely, we'll take this. Um, but we didn't really know what the Vigango were at that time. Um, and so we took them, never displayed them, and didn't have any expertise in-house with which to, to study them, quite frankly. So they sat in a storeroom, which is what museums should not be doing. Uh, but in, in the early 2000s, late 90s, early 2000s, Monica Udvardi of the University of Kentucky started researching uh, Vigongo and found and engaged in repatriation, found some of the original carvers of some Vigongo. Um, and it was her work that we started trying to emulate, trying to replicate uh, for the, the um, 
Vigongo in our collection. And in 2014, we went the political route. We um, went instead of through the museums or through the universities, we found out that Denver is a sister city with um, Nairobi. And so we got our mayor and our council person and our museum CEO there on the left, together with um, dignitaries from uh, city and county of Nairobi, plus the acting Kenyan ambassador at the time, they came to Denver and we held a signing ceremony said that Denver Museum of Nature and Science is going to repatriate these. And, you know, great, we thought it was, we're all good to go. And through a series of bureaucratic issues that we don't have time to go into, it didn't happen in 2014. And then, as I mentioned, it didn't really happen until um, Purity and I happened to be at the same program in Los Angeles. Um, here is, but we got it done. Here's our Vigongo arriving uh, back at the National Museum of Kenya. But for me, as a museum person, as an anthropologist, as a humanist, the, I, you know, by all rights, I could have just said, all right, National Museum of Kenya signed for these things, I am done. But that didn't provide the kind of closure that I needed. So I worked with Purity to arrange for my family and I to come over to meet with the Midji Kenda to talk. And this wasn't necessarily a mission for me to apologize, because frankly, I didn't feel like I as an individual had anything to apologize for. I as a professional, as a museum person, did want to engage in discussions, in um, ceremonies, in activities, in eating together and looking people in the eye and saying, all right, I understand that the harm that was done, let's see what we can do to change this situation and move forward. So we got to participate in a welcoming ceremony uh, in one of the villages there in one of the sacred forests um, and speeches uh, were had, some of the Mijikenda elders here and you can see Purity there on the left as well as some of the other employees from the National Muse Museums of Kenya. Um, and I'm not gonna lie, selfishly, this was the kind of closure that I needed. But it's also an opportunity for the future because again, these are relationships made between people. Um, and so I pledged while I was there to do everything that I could both personally and professionally to assist with um, the, the, the creation of a space for the, the Vigongo that are being repatriated. Uh, because there's concern that if they put them back up on the homesteads or in the forests that they'll be threatened and could be taken away again. So there's discussions about creating a center for the Vigongo. Uh, it's a long process, um, but keep in mind that repatriation is not about giving stuff back. It is about creating new relationships through which we all work productively and happily going forward. It's not a net loss. It is a gain if we get out of our colonialist museum interpretations that all that museums do is collect and preserve. Okay. Thank you. Before we um, get to questions, because we're running short on time, I just want to say, um, on behalf of all the attendees, uh, I extend a warm thank you to the outstanding leaders and thinkers uh, who have joined me this afternoon, evening. Um, I'm grateful for the work you all are doing and your leadership really inspires um, others to take action. Let's turn to the chat, see what questions we can answer. I wish that I had like three more hours with all of you <laughs> because this has been um, so, so uh, wonderful hearing the work you're doing. Um, I just will relay a question and answer. Uh, it was answered in the, in the um, uh, chat. Um, we had a question, do Kenya, Tanzania, and Ethiopia work together fighting this illicit trade? Um, and uh, uh, Purity answered, yes, all countries in Africa through their embassies abroad as well um, as at all borders have put mechanisms to make sure nothing leaves their borders without permission. The issue of cultural objects is just starting to pick up now and we hope to have better mechanisms in place. Um, for the Q&A, um, I have a question that, uh, let's see. Um, are museums working, uh, are museums working on their own or working together to write new policies for ethically adding to their collections? Um, and uh, I, I see Adriana um, typed an answer um, saying that Sweden, in Sweden, every museum is working on their own under Swedish law. Um, do other, um, other folks on the panel have any um, insight into how, how your museums or museums you've worked with, how they are working on policies of, of collecting? I can, Brooke. I would say that most of them are working independently 
but leadership matters. And there are certain institutions that are doing more than others. And it, people are taking notice. It's taken a long time, but people are taking notice. And frankly, I'm thrilled about what I'm seeing in Europe. And Purity mentioned France, and, and we've been talking about Sweden. What's happening in Europe has been a seismic shift in just the last five years. Um, so, so momentum builds. I guess the advantage in, in Kenya is that uh, all museums are under one institution. So, so they all have to work through that one institution to come up with whatever regulations and law they have to come up with. But you, we involve all other stakeholders, including government, because if government is not there, then even at the borders, then you may not be able to know what is living and what is not living. So we involve all the stakeholders and all, definitely the communities where all these uh, objects are coming from. Okay, and this is for, um, for Steve. What do you say to professional colleagues who say we do NAGPRA and that's enough or who refuse to consider international repatriation? I say that the law is a very low bar. Um, the law is only one way to govern behavior and govern um, institutional activity. I would say let's consider morals and ethics um, and actively consider morals and ethics because those are not written in stone. They change and, uh, and the law is a very low bar. Um, look at what's happening right now in the United States with African American human remains that are in uh, collections. NAGPRA only covers Native American human remains. It doesn't cover African American, Asian American, Euro American human remains that are in museums without informed consent. So the approach that we took here at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science is that we won't even consider curating human remains in the absence of informed consent. That is a moral and ethical principle that is not the law. And I think that um, a lot of museums quite frankly hide behind the law as a way to not more actively consider these things. But our collecting practices, our preservation practices have actively caused harm to communities. And that is not something that I want to be involved in. I want to try and help rectify that. So the law is a very low bar. All right. And I think we've got time for one more. Um, can museums take a lead role in reaching out to private collectors to help them repatriate slash rematriate cultural items? If I can jump in here with the Vigongo story, we when we had a story published in the New York Times in 2014, we had a number of private collectors reach out to the Denver Museum of Nature and Science to learn about the repatriation. So it wasn't even an outreach that we did, it was by media stories that people learn about these kinds of activities. Um, you know, in this country, private property is a, is a difficult challenge because um, people own it and they, there's no qualms about that. But yes, pri some private collectors are working with museums. And it's, it's actually unfortunate that some of those private collectors, even up to today, they are still continuing to collect. Even with the, the discourse which is going on, we are still getting a few, a few information on people. And, and most of them now, they want to, to sell off whatever they had collected before. So there's a lot of that going on, especially in Britain. And, uh, but we are able to pick up on some of those and uh, work with a few, but many of them know. All right, well, thank you all panelists. Um, thank you attendees for um, your good questions. I'm sorry we could not get to all of them. Um, we're a little over time already, um, but uh, I believe that uh, you can probably reach out to um, the folks on the panel um, uh, and uh, or, or contact um, the ISM and we'll pass on um, emails if you have specific questions um, for anyone on the panel that we didn't get to. Um,